This is an ABC News special report. Now reporting, David Muir. Good afternoon. We're coming back on the air because President Biden is about to speak to the nation, responding to today's very significant Supreme Court ruling, essentially striking down affirmative action from college admissions across the U.S. In a 6-3 decision affecting millions of students moving forward, the justice is striking down admissions policies at both Harvard and the University of North Carolina, and in doing so, overturning decades of precedent in this country. Their ruling says race cannot be a factor in determining college admissions. The court's six conservative justices finding admissions practices at both of those schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Chief Justice John Roberts writing both policies employ race in a, quote, negative manner. Justice Clarence Thomas saying they, quote, fly in the face of our colorblind constitution. In her dissent, Justice Sonia Sotomayor writing the decision rolls back decades of precedent and, quote, momentous progress. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, the court's first black female justice, calling the decision, quote, truly a tragedy for us all. Chief Justice Roberts leaving open the possibility of colleges considering race when it comes to an individual student's application, focusing on the student's, quote, experiences as an individual, but not on the basis of race. Mary Bruce is outside the White House. Mary, the president has been huddling with his advisors. And yes, David, I was told that the president learned of this decision from the breaking news reports. And then he met with his counsel shortly after he gathered together his senior staff who have been working on this issue to dissect the decision. Also, I suspect to craft the response that we are about to hear. This, of course, is an administration that has put equality at the heart of everything they do. And here comes the president, David. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Sorry to keep you waiting a few minutes. Forty-five years, for 45 years, the United States Supreme Court has recognized the college's freedom to decide how, how to build diverse student bodies and to meet their responsibility of opening doors of opportunity for every single American. <clears throat> in case after case, including recently, uh, just as a few years ago in 2016, the court has affirmed and reaffirmed this view, that colleges could use race not as a determinant factor for admission, but as one of the factors among many in deciding who to admit from a, quali from a qualified, already qualified pool of applicants. Today, the court once again walked away from decades of precedent and make, as the dissent has made clear. The dissent states in today's decision, quote, rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress, end of quote. I agree with that statement from the dissent. From, from the dissent. <clears throat> The court has effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. And I strongly, strongly disagree with the court's decision. Because affirmative action is so misunderstood, I want to be clear, make sure everybody's clear about what the law has been and what it has not been until today. Many people wrongly believe that affirmative action allows unqualified students, unqualified students to be admitted ahead of qualified students. This is not. This is not how college admissions work. Rather, colleges set out standards for admission, and every student, every student has to meet those standards. Then and only then, after first meeting the qualifications required by the school, do colleges look at other factors in addition to their grades, such as race. The way it works in practice is this. Colleges first establish a qualified pool of candidates based on meeting certain grade, test scores, and other criteria. Then and only then, then and only then, it is from this pool of applicants, all of whom have already met the school standards, that the class is chosen after weighing a wide range of factors, among them being race. You know, I've always believed that one of the greatest strengths of America, you're tired of hearing me say it, is our diversity. But I believe that. If you have any doubt about this, just look at the United States military the finest fighting force in the history of the world. It's been a model of diversity, and has not only been our, made our nation better, stronger, but safer. I believe the same is true for our schools. I've always believed that the promise of America is big enough for everyone to succeed, and that every generation of Americans, we have benefited by opening the doors of opportunity just a little bit wider to include those who've been left behind. I believe our colleges are stronger, when they are racially diverse. Our nation is stronger because we use, because we are tapping into the full range of talent in this nation. 
I also believe that while talent, creativity, and hard work are everywhere across this country, not equal opportunity. It is not everywhere across this country. We cannot let this decision be the last word. I want to emphasize we cannot let this decision be the last word. While the court can render a decision, it cannot change what America stands for. America is an idea, an idea unique in the world, an idea of hope, an opportunity, of possibilities, of giving everyone a fair shot, of leaving no one behind. We've never fully lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it either. We will not walk away from it now. We should never allow the country to walk away from the dream upon which it was founded. That opportunity is for everyone, not just a few. We need a new path forward, a path consistent with the law that protects diversity and expands opportunity. So today I want to offer some guidance to our nation's colleges as they review their admission systems after today's decision. Guidance that is consistent with today's decision. They should not abandon, let me say this again, they should not abandon their commitment to ensure student bodies of diverse backgrounds and experience that reflect all of America. What I propose for consideration is a new standard, where colleges take into account the adversity a student has overcome when selecting among qualified applicants. Let's be clear, under this new standard, just as was true under the earlier standard, students first have to be qualified applicants. They need the GPA and test scores to meet the school's standards. Once that test is met, then adversity should be considered, including a student's lack of financial means, because we know too few students of low-income families, whether in big cities or rural communities, are getting an opportunity to go to college. When the poor kid, when a poor kid, maybe the first in their family to go to college, gets the same grades and test scores as a wealthy kid, his whole family has gone to the most elite colleges in the country and whose path has been a lot easier. Well, the kid who faced tougher challenges has demonstrated more grit, more determination, and that should be a factor that colleges should take into account in admissions, and many still do. It also means examining where the student grew up and went to high school. It means understanding the particular hardships that each individual student has faced in life, including racial discrimination that individuals have faced in their own lives. The court says, quote, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an application's discussion of how race has affected his or her life, but, it's, it's through, but be it through discrimination or inspiration or otherwise, end of quote. Because the truth is, we all know it, discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Today's decision does not change that. It's a simple fact. If a student has, has overcome, had to overcome adversity on their path to education, the college should recognize and value that. Our nation colleges and universities should be engines of expanding opportunity through upward mobility. But today, too often, that's not the case. The statistics, one, one statistic, Students from the top 1% of family incomes in America are 77 times more likely to get into elite college than one from the bottom 20% of family incomes. 77% greater opportunity. Today, for too many schools, the only people who benefit from the system are the wealthy and the well-connected. The odds have been stacked against working people for much too long. We need a higher education system that works for everyone. From, App from Appalachia to Atlanta and to far beyond. We can and must do better, and we will. Today, <clears throat> I'm directing the Department of Education to analyze what practices help build a more inclusive and diverse student bodies and what practices hold that back. Practices like legacy admissions and other systems <clears throat> expand privilege instead of opportunity. Colleges and universities should continue their commitment to support, retain, and graduate the first students and classes. You know, and companies, companies who are already realizing the value of diversity should not use this decision as an excuse to turn away from diversity either. And we can't go backwards. You know, I know today's court decision is a severe disappointment to so many people, including me but we cannot let the decision be a permanent setback for the country. We need to keep an open door of opportunities. 
We need to remember that diversity is our strength. <clears throat> we have to find a way forward. We need to remember that the promise of America is big enough for everyone to succeed. You know, that's the work of my administration. And I'm always going to fight for that. And I want to thank you all. And I know you've been told I have a helicopter out there waiting to go up to do an interview in New York. I'll be talking more about this live interview. But thank you very much. And we're going to have plenty of time to talk about this. But we're not going to let this break us. Thank you. President Biden, the Congressional Black Caucus said the Supreme Court has thrown into question its own legitimacy. Is this a rogue court? This is not a normal court. Should there be term limits for the justices, sir? The president there leaving the Roosevelt Room saying that he uh, wants to offer guidance now to schools, universities, uh, colleges across this country that they should not abandon the practice of making sure they have a diverse student body or whatever that practice should be moving forward needs to be defined at this point. He said he's going to ask the Department of Education to look into options. Uh, he's proposing that uh, colleges continue to first find the most qualified students across the board, but then to take into account uh, the adversity that they have faced in their lifetime, lack of financial means, among other uh, criteria. I want to bring in Mary Bruce. It's still uh, unclear what the president can really uh, make happen at this point, given the ruling from the Supreme Court. Yeah, but the president certainly is trying to give Americans the impression that he's doing everything that he can do. The president coming out today trying to assure Americans you know, that he does have a plan, even if there's not a lot he can do on his own. The president urging universities and institutions to continue to consider diversity as much as they can, to take into account adversity, racial discrimination, of course, socioeconomic challenges in a student's background, because the president's making the argument that today's decision, as he said, doesn't change the fact that discrimination exists in our country. And he's also, of course, asking the Department of Education to look into what additional steps they may be able to take to try and expand opportunity. But look, there is only so much a president can do. And I think this White House is well aware, the Biden campaign is well aware that this is an issue that they hope will drive voters come next November. And the president trying to give an impression that he's doing as much as he can. And David, that comment there at the end is notable. The president asked as he was leaving the room if he thinks this is a rogue court. He took a very long pause there before saying this is not a normal court. I can tell you we are already asking what exactly he means by that. And of course, Mary, that is a hint at what's to come in this campaign. They will likely take on the fact that this court, the balance of the court, uh, shifted significantly in recent years. And, and the argument, of course, to voters is that your vote matters. You know, who you put into office has a direct relationship to the balance of power on the Supreme Court for generations to come. And I think you are going to see both parties in this election seize on this issue. You already are seeing that. You've certainly seen plenty of Republicans, Republican candidates and Republican lawmakers and governors uh, seizing on the issue of inclusion and diversity and those policies. So there's going to be a lot more uh, topics to discuss when it comes to this issue, David. Mary, thank you. You. Two more quick points to make on this. I'm going to bring in Terry Moran, who has covered the Supreme Court for years for us. And Terry, there was reaction almost immediately from uh, members of the court, uh, both Justices uh, uh, Clarence Thomas and Sonia Sotomayor. And it was really interesting. Both have acknowledged in their own life stories how they have benefited from affirmative action to get to where they are today, obviously sitting on the highest court uh, in the nation, but both deciding uh, very differently how to move forward in this country. Absolutely. You can hear in the justices' opinions themselves, especially those from Justice Clarence Thomas and Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson as well, uh, the same passions around this issue uh, that you can sense in the entire country. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas you know, saying at, that this was something that he recognized, the problem of racial discrimination. He says he understands how what he called his race, my race, he said, has been ravaged. Uh, by discrimination and racial prejudice, but he said he held out hope uh, that the nation's original promises of equality embodied in the Declaration and the Constitution will still come true. And Justice Sonia Sotomayor saying that this is a tragedy for the country, uh, that the country nevertheless is in the throes of a movement towards equality that she said will not be stopped. So you could hear the emotions there. As for President Biden, you heard in his remarks the same uncertainty that is now descending on every college and university in the country that uses these kinds of metrics now outlawed to reach uh, some kind of diversity on campus because while affirmative action as we know it is over, the Supreme Court just ended it, it the Supreme Court in Justice uh, Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion did not say you can never 
consider race. You consider it, he said, on an individual basis, depending on how it affected the individual applicant. But as Justice Sonia Sotomayor points out, that will invite a plethora of litigation and what she called chaos, uh, because Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts did not define really any more than that rather vague pointing at the individual story, how race will factor in to the construction of the diverse student bodies that colleges and universities around the country are used to and want to continue because they believe it enriches the educational experience for all. Yeah, it leaves the door open for interpretation as to how to move forward. Terry, thank you. And in fact, uh, in that decision uh, from the Chief Justice, John Roberts, you know, they do talk about how it can't simply be replaced now with an essay that talks about race, but that, it, in other words, the student must be treated based on his or her experience as an individual, not on the basis of race. Many universities have for far too long done just the opposite. That was in the opinion handed down uh, from the court. But as Terry was just talking about, one of the other significant developments of the day is you have uh, justices on the court that have acknowledged that affirmative action has helped them get to where they are today, but then they have differed differed on this notion of whether or not to continue that for the next generation coming up behind them. Clarence Thomas arguing uh, not to move forward with affirmative action, something that helped him along the way. Sonia Sotomayor, Ketanji Brown-Jackson, uh, emphatic uh, in their dissent today, saying that's simply not the case. We should be continuing this for future generations, uh, trying to, um, you know, improve upon the lot that uh, their family might be in in this country. I want to bring in Rachel Scott, who is covering the race for the White House reaction almost immediately. We just listened to the president there, Rachel. Uh, not a lot he can do, but he is signaling to universities across the country, colleges, schools, and even beyond that, in the, in the across the economic sector, companies that have encouraged a diverse workforce to continue not to be swayed by what they've heard from the court. And when it comes to schools themselves, he said they should not abandon student bodies of diverse backgrounds and work to get there. Uh, in the meantime, you're hearing from Republican candidates, Donald Trump, who of course leads the pack, and, and from a couple of candidates who've talked about their own race, their own background, and the path that got them to where they are today. Swift reaction coming in from the Republican field, starting with the front runner, former President Donald Trump, in a statement to ABC News. He calls this a great day for America, saying that we're going back to all merit base, saying that's the way that it should be. Trump allies, aides, his own super PAC, very quick to make it clear that this is the decision that was made possible by the former president with three of the justices that he nominated currently sitting on this conservative Supreme Court bench. And that praise is being echoed up and down the the Republican primary field, even with candidates, as you mentioned, David, that have made their own diversity, their own personal stories, a central part of their campaign. Former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley introduced herself to the nation as a child of immigrants. She goes on to say in a statement that this decision will help every student, regardless of background, reach the American dream. And Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, who often talks about his own rise from poverty, calling this good news, saying that it should be celebrated across the nation, David. And bottom line, Quick question there as we wrap up here, Rachel. You pointed out that uh, Donald Trump's super PAC, obviously the group supporting him, one of uh, many supporting his uh, run for uh, the presidency again, saying this directly points to who Donald Trump chose when he was president to serve on the nation's highest court. And you heard from President Biden and from Mary Bruce reporting on the Biden campaign that these are going to be the dueling arguments. So look what uh, Donald Trump was able to appoint to the court. It has shifted the court significantly. And now President Biden, as he runs for re-election, will argue your vote matters given what we're looking at at the Supreme Court. David, while there is not much divide within the Republican Party, you can certainly expect this issue to be front and center as we move into the general election when you have President Biden expressing disappointment with today's decision, even calling out the Supreme Court there on his way out of that room. And you have former President Donald Trump and many of his allies taking credit, pointing to his strength and his decisions to nominate these conservative justices on the bench that has certainly shaped the Supreme Court for decades to come, David. Rachel Scott, continuing with our live coverage here of this uh, momentous decision from the Supreme Court today. Rachel, thank you. Our coverage will continue all day long. ABC News Live, abcnews.com. And, of course, I'll be back with the entire team for World News Tonight. I'm David Muir in New York. Until then, have a good afternoon. This has been a special report from ABC News.